Ooh, I'm gonna start the video right here. Quick, quick little update at the end of this vlog is now the beginning. But if you guys like the Megan and Whitney show, my podcast, I moved it to its own channel just so that I could keep my shit super motorcycle driven and nerdy just because obviously there's like a deficit of motorcycle content. It's growing like crazy, which is awesome though. So I'm going to put a link down below. Megan and Whitney show has its own YouTube channel. Go ahead and subscribe it. You guys are now going to be seeing me on the Yamcast. Jake has... Jake has spread his wings and flown the coop and he is now doing his own YouTube channel full time. So you can check out his shit at Spite's Corner. You can follow him on Instagram at Spite454 and I will be on obviously continue hosting my own podcast every single week where Megan and I just talk about esoteric dick jokes, fart jokes, boob jokes, poop jokes, um, all that stuff. Greetings, people of the internet. I'm on my way to go grab a beer with Jake and Josh. What a perfect opportunity to ride one of my favorite motorcycles that I apparently haven't talked about at all. 2018 BMW R9T, whose battery is probably going to die. <laughs> Which is a good um, thing to start off with. Dude, I have had zero issues with this bike. Like that's how reliable it is. I'm seeing that I'm gonna need a new battery soon and I'm gonna get on it anyways. And now I'm gonna definitely regret it because, you know, that's just how the universe works and we, and we deal with it, we take chances. But I've taken this motorcycle to the track like an idiot with square bald tires. That was fun. Um, I didn't want to, I just came out side of my XSR 900 had a loose ass chain the rear sprocket was roasted it had just gotten back from a rental I was really pissed <laughs> because I was like oh I'll just go rip around the XSR 900 on the track it's not super fun in terms of like comfort or ergonomics but it's still a beast so then I had to haul ass to Harris Hill on my BMW and I don't I want to say it was on TKC 80s, I might be wrong. There may have been a sport touring tire on it at that point. And tech almost didn't pass me because they were like, you know, your rear tire is absolutely roasted. We don't we don't feel safe with you going out here. And I was like, that's what every fucking person wants to hear on your second track day is like, um, this is really dangerous. We don't know if we should approve you or not. They looked at me square in the eye and they're like, just just don't go fast and be really careful. As if I wasn't already super nervous to bring a behemoth of a bike out on a track that I'd never been to. But it was really nice. There was a lot of super supportive people there and they're like, look, we call it getting mileage. Like, just go slow. Like, just go slow around the track and have fun. Work through all of your mental anguish alone inside of a motorcycle helmet. So I did. I brought this to the drag strip because between all three bikes, I was like, the R9T is heavy and it's a ripper. And my husband Lucas got on it and just absolutely crushed a Honda Fire, a Honda Fireblade, which makes sense because it's like at a drag, at a drag strip. Uh, you know, it's an eighth mile. It's like, whatever has got the torquiest, most, most horsepower is going to fucking crush it. I had a lot of fun launching it at the drag strip, too. It was just a beast. Um, doing silly things with a silly bike is kind of my MO, too. It's just, it's just fun. I just want to have fucking fun. I don't want to take anything too seriously. So, the origin story of this bike was that... I had gotten the Ducati Scrambler, and after about three months of riding that, I was pretty much over it. Um, it just didn't have the power that I wanted it to have on the highway, and just being new to modern bikes, I now realize that I could have opened it up myself, but it probably would have been pretty expensive, and doing valve service on that, as you know, is expensive, so I'm glad I got rid of it. 
and the dealer plus my husband just talked me into this super sexy motorcycle and I had never thought in a million years that I was ever going to own a BMW just because I thought that was above me and it was super prestigious but they had this one left and I got it for like 12 out the door they were just trying to get rid of it I always really liked the Scrambler, the one with the silver tank, and then the Cafe Racer was also super cool, but not a grocery getter, and this is definitely my grocery getter. So, I didn't even, I've never test ridden any of my bikes. I look at it and I go, that's the one I want. Because also just, you know, when you're like me and you're not buying these bikes outright, it's so easy if you don't like something for the dealership to buy it back or trade it in really a seamless process I mean I all I remember is the salesman handing me the keys and being like oh it's yours now and I was like cool into it so I walked out it was raining I walked out with a BMW R9 T and I couldn't believe it and obviously it was a lot it felt a lot heavier it felt different than my Ducati Scrambler but it was just so damn sexy that I was kind of in shock and awe, you know, that this was the lady I was bringing home. And I loved it right away. It is funny though, I think it was like maybe the third day I owned it, I was parked. Everybody has a story like this, you know, and at that time I had owned like three or four motorcycles and then this was my fourth or fifth one. <clears throat> and I was parked outside of work and I was just like kind of parked at like one of those super gravelly, you know, they don't ever clean the streets down here in Austin. So it was just like gravelly kind of crooked parking, parking spot. I had, there's a huge group. I don't know. I think they were like touring because I worked at the hotel. They were like touring the property and they're all staring at me. And then I'm getting all nervous that I'm being stared at and I don't understand if they need something or if I know them or what the hell is going on so all of my mental energy is focused on them I get on the bike I get the kickstand up I grab first gear and I just fall over <laughs> my brand new BMW bike and now this group of people are laughing at me so my ego is super fucking bruised I am stuck I was stuck under this heavy ass motorcycle but I was fully geared so nothing happened and my coworker was in his car right behind me. He came out and we both just like pulled up the bike right away. And the group of people were still laughing and pointing at me. And I was really bummed because obviously when the BMW hits the ground, the first thing that gets whacked is the engine, which is not ideal. Um, I was, I was pissed about it, but Another good thing about it hitting the engine is like the bars were fine, the mirrors were fine, everything was fine. <clears throat> you know, but then I get a BMW and everybody's bitching about how expensive they are to maintain and I have no idea what anyone's talking about. I'm going on my, it's going to be my fifth year owning this. I have never had to dump any sort of expense into this. It's like 70 bucks to change the oil and it's a beefcake of an engine that's legendary in terms of longevity. They're still using that World War II airplane technology in this, in this engine. And that's what I love about it because I'm a, I'm a vintage bike nerd through and through, but I got really tired of wasting all of my money on parts and broken bikes and never riding and doing that whole, doing that whole jam. So when the Neo Retro Wave hit, I was first in line. I was, you know, getting my credit score ready to just buy as many bikes as possible. And that's exactly what I did. At the dealership, the dudes, you know, they take you back to the BMW guys and they're like, you know, it's your first BMW, talk to them. And they were like, dude, just work on your bike. They're like, don't ever bring it here. And I thought that that was really funny. They're like, they're so easy to work on and they're right. You know, I've changed the air box filter. I've changed the spark plugs. What else have I done? Obviously oil changes. The valves are super accessible. Like obviously I have to take off the 
the cage, but I don't know. It's like, it's all right there. It's all exposed, just begging for you to work on it with its big jugs. And I love the, I love the character. I love the old school character that you get with this. Love the sound. Like even the stock sound I enjoy. There's a really fucking awesome exhaust that Lucas showed me. It's like four grand. <laughs> but it's so fucking cool looking and it sounds so mean. <clears throat> I'm about to, I'm about to lane split here. This is so silly. All right, I told you that it's cheap to maintain. It looks super sexy. Oh, you know, I've off-roaded it too. Like obviously I'm not going like through the forest or anything, but for Yammy Noob, we did like a big scrambler shootout. We had a Triumph, we had the BMW, and then we had the Ducati Scrambler. And we just like went off and had fun with them and you know, went on a bunch of like dusty gravelly bits and we had a blast. I've had too many close calls lane filtering while traffic is kind of moving like this because in this state, they don't move over for you. And in fact, they just like get mad and try to run you over. It's got awesome fucking power for the highway. Like this thing makes 80 miles an hour feel really slow. Obviously the thing that like takes some getting used to, but then again, I'm not a cruiser person, so I'm not ever riding heavy bikes. And you know, I've had some renters who are cruiser people who are like, look, this is all I could find, but I had a fucking blast. Cause it, it, it's still got like that nice meaty weight, still pretty comfortable to ride. And it's got a lot of power. So it's kind of hitting those more cruisery elements than other bikes. That's another thing too, is like, this is an ideal bike for renting out, right? Cause it's, it looks really good. It's fun. It's comfortable. Every single person that has come back from a rental absolutely fucking loves this bike. They love it. What's not, I mean, I don't know what they're, what's not to love about it. It's sexy. It's beefy. It's got power. Like whenever it's raining out or there's inclement weather, like this is the bike I grab. This is the bike that it just feels stable on, on the road, you know, when it's really windy. And I should make another video about wind if you guys want to see it. Cause I'm one of those people that also gets distracted when you get like blown all over the road and it's kind of hard to concentrate. Obviously with like this heavier bike, you can just, it doesn't bother me as much. Whereas on this far peeling, oh my God, that thing, it's like making you a human air hockey puck. This is another, like, just like this far peeling is not going anywhere anytime soon for my garage. Neither is the R9T. It just, it's, it's the bike that someone like me gets a fucking boner about every time. It's so cool. There's a, there's actually a person I follow on Instagram and she travels all of Europe on her R9T because it can do that. You know, it's got ample, ample space for a passenger, ample space for a shit ton of bags. It's heavy. The only issue with it being heavy for like me is it's hard to pick up <laughs> from my store. That's the only time I've ever dropped it, but I couldn't get it up by myself. I was, I was trapped underneath it. I also brought it into the dealer. I was like, dude, I dropped it. Um, can you just check the side that I dropped it on and see if there's any damage? And they did. And they're like, no, there's, there was a, was it a grommet or a washer? that was just like super squished in there and they said that they had one line around so they replaced it and didn't charge me or anything obviously but they're like these engines can kind of take a beating they're like i wouldn't worry about it it also burns oil like crazy um they told me that it was going to stop burning oil around 50,000 miles I remember when I first got this, I went to Motivation and they were like so stoked that I got this because I had a bunch of aftermarket parts for it. Somebody there had a friend who had an R90 and he was like, he just bored out the engine at 300,000 miles. I was like, how the fuck do you ride that much in two years? But either way, uh, Either way, I was like sick. This I know that this engine is known for lasting forever, and I enjoy that. Just as like a vintage bike nerd, that's what you want to hear. It's music to my ears. 
that means it can just become a family heirloom and I'm sure none of my kids are going to want to inherit it, but I'm going to make them. Here we go. Dear Austin traffic, go away. Although here I am, I, you know, meeting up buddies at rush hour on a Friday. Do you think I can fit through there? <laughs> I don't think I could. I think I'd run into those big semi spikes. Like, what are those even for? Oh, he's got a Yosemite Sam decal. Also, as you can see, it would, this is sacrilegious for sure, but I've left like the stock levers, the stock mirrors. They make so many cool after parts for this bike, so I feel dumb for not changing anything, but I just used all my extra capital to buy another motorcycle. So dumping a bunch of money on like essentially candy doesn't really appeal to me. Maybe when I've got a bunch of extra cash lying around, I can, but they make really awesome bar end mirrors. I think uh, Moto Gadget makes a really cool aftermarket dash too for this. You can just like beef it out to be the fucking coolest looking bike in my opinion. Somebody, I've had two people offer to buy this, which is silly. They've like, they rented it and they're like, are you selling it? I really want to buy it. Some guy was like, I'll give you 14 for it. I was like, what? <laughs> no, thanks. It's flattering, but no, get your grubby paws off my bike. I guess if I was desperate for cash, I would do that, but I'm not desperate for cash, so I don't give a fuck. It's got 23,000 miles on it. I haven't done any long trips with this. I'm not a long trip sort of person. I think I'm reserving all of that for when my kids are grown. I want to be that ADB dad that goes out and does fun rides. Sometimes if you close your eyes while you're riding it, you can pretend that you're a World War II era style plane. don't know where I'm going. Uh, I don't think. I think I'm gonna go down Old Twerf. It's so funny, I did like the quintessential American thing, which was just start on big, gigantic, heavy motorcycles. <laughs> like it was a giant and heavy and has a thousand cc's, tight. Let me buy that one. I don't, I honestly don't think you always need to start on, it kind of depends on your age and your personality type, you know, if, if you're smart and agile, I don't, I really don't think you have to always start on a baby sport bike. Ideally, everybody just starts on a dirt bike and then gets really good and buys whatever the hell they want. I'm also trying to squeeze some esoteric existential bits in here. Um, lately, I've been thinking about how we never progress forward because we always are stuck with these archaic infrastructures that took forever to build and then to change them is really hard and really expensive. So it's like, at what point is humanity going to overcome that barrier of like cost and complexity and kind of catapult us into, you know, the lunchbox future that we always wanted, right? Like you'd see old lunchboxes that would say the year 2000 and then everybody had flying cars and robots were our friends and they are to a degree. Obviously we've interwoven a lot of like really crazy technology into our daily life, but I still feel like we're all stuck on this petroleum-based uh, infrastructure, which I'm not mad about it, <laughs> but it's like, man, this doesn't make sense. Can't we do something cooler? Can't we fly further with less energy or time to hang with the boys? Perfect. Right by the cacti. All right, where are these dinguses?